quartet has rehearsal from 10 to 2, uh, Monday through Friday. And then Mondays, for example, uh, well, last year at least, were my big teaching day. So, uh, you know, I'd run back to Emory. We usually rehearse at uh, one of our members' houses. Then uh, we come here and from like 3 to 9, just basically teaching. And that includes, can include, sectionals for orchestra, chamber music, coachings, you know, things like that. So that, for, for that was my Monday. Of course, we still have rehearsals the rest of the week. And we'll be asked to do sectionals for both the university orchestra and then also for the youth orchestra. And that's great for us because, you know, I, I actually miss playing in orchestra just because it's great literature. And it's wonderful to teach these kids who, a lot of, a lot of whom, just have an amazing amount of talent. They're going to go off and do other things, probably, but they're just, they're just wonderful kids and it's just really inspiring and it's a good shot in the arm to be like, oh, okay, there is a future in this, in this business. We try to construct a program or at least a series of three or four quartets that you know, we can offer to presenters. Leading up to a concert, we'll be really fine-tuning details and making artistic decisions, and so a lot of that time is, is spent there, putting nuts and bolts together and hashing it out. And that's, that's really the, the sort of the bread and butter of, of quartet land. If you were to sit in rehearsal, you know, you're going to see a lot of kind of mundane things, much like an orchestra rehearsal. Are we going to do this up bow? Are we going to do this down bow? What's your interpretation of legato? What's your interpretation of you know, espressivo? I mean, so it's a lot of that kind of figuring out where we agree. You know, it's amazing how much is, is in flux. We've been doing it this way for X amount of days, months, years, but hey, let's try it this way now. And then people, you know, oh, hey, that, that actually works. I can see it that way now. What's wonderful about having a, a rather narrow repertoire in a season is that you have the opportunity to perform it more than once. So we can do it this way and hey, let's try it this other way and see if it works. And sometimes it just doesn't. There are things that work in performance that don't work in the practice room. For people who would like a little bit of a window into quartet life, a late quartet, the movie, is actually pretty good. It's like everything that could possibly go wrong in a quartet happens in like three days. Of course it's not that dramatic. So I had a lot of support from my parents, having great teachers, and then being close enough to the epicenters of culture, you know, New York and Philly, where I was able to draw a little bit from that. Um, I don't think the discussion would be complete without mentioning the Suzuki method. I have mixed feelings about it because I think that in large part, especially now, because of its rapid success in the States, it's been appropriated to various individual teachers' ends like to create a professional musician, which was never the intent of Shinichi Suzuki. I mean, he was looking to raise, you know, beautiful people who would have a sort of cultural sense and also a discipline um, which could translate to anything else. So a lot of people rag on the method. I think they have to put it a little bit more in context. For me, I just had a wonderful teacher growing up, Linda Fiore. And she's just a great teacher who happens to be a Suzuki teacher. Uh, I went to the seventh book, so I guess for about six years. I started when I was three. I switched teachers to a you know traditional teacher who was wonderful as well. Um, when I was nine, I was doing things like the Settlement Music School in Philadelphia, and then my senior year of high school, I was in the Juilliard Pre College. And I was still doing youth competitions and summer festivals and things to get a sense of you know what the level would be if I were going to be serious about this. The two stand out for me were Kinhaven, um, which was a wonderful, uh, wonderfully supportive atmosphere, and also Encore. Um, it was a practice camp. Man, the level there, I mean, some of the names that you're hearing today were there. You know, so it was like, okay, this is the real deal. Time to really get your act together. I think that's the strength of Suzuki, is that because it's based on, Suzuki calls it the mother tongue approach, you're learning by ear to begin with. You don't really start reading music until you would start reading text. So at that point, and once you've sort of gotten that out of the way, you can really start to focus in and, and start doing the, 
you know, all the sort of exercises and technical things that one would need to do to, to become a pro. And one of the earliest memories was they had a mat, like a rug, with uh, feet outlines, and I just hated standing on that. And that was like a, it was part of the disciplining aspect of, you know, you have to have a certain posture and a certain poise when you're playing. And of course, teaching a three-year-old who wants to just move everywhere to do that was just, for me, that was hellish. But <laughs> I mean, of course, you got over that. And the wonderful thing too is group class. So I remember that a lot. That was a lot of fun. We would have um, an individual lesson and then a group class, I think every week or at least every two weeks. And so the group class was a wonderful socialization uh, kind of exercise and everyone in, is in the room so the littlest kids and the oldest people right. and you just go through the repertoire and right. you stop when when you're done and you yeah. sit down and you listen to everyone else so it's a great way to kind of see where you are in the spectrum but also to to just share in the experience so. right now I'm playing on uh, an instrument that I commissioned from a luthier in Italy. Uh, we lived in Italy for about a year in Vicenza, close to Venice. And in Breganze, which is in the province of Vicenza, there uh, lives a, a luthier who is, I think, pretty well known now in Italy. I mean, he's won a few prizes, uh, the Tchaikovsky, um, I guess, acoustical competition. He's won first prize in that a few times. But so this is a 2002, and the, the guy's name is Fabio Dalla Costa. And it's a wonderful instrument, and I actually just recently got it readjusted, and it's sounding much better actually. You know, of course, new instruments take a while to kind of breathe and mature and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm really happy with it. To be playing on a modern Italian that sounds really good, I feel again, very fortunate. That's a good question. You know, again, the conservatories are designed, especially for string players, to create soloists. And it's sort of like the path is, okay, so you don't become a soloist, so what's next? Uh, let's try orchestra. Oh, uh, let's try chamber music. Let's try teaching. Let's do all this kind of stuff. And, and that's how it's, I mean, it really is viewed as a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I see the sense in that because the solo literature is challenging and there's a lot of it and you, know, you can really build your technique doing that. If you're 14, 15, 16, and you don't have a solo career these days, you're probably not going to have one. It's going to be the very, very, very few people who get those things. And a lot of factors apply. I just, I prefer chamber music. You know, it's just a wonderful mode of expression. You know, you have compatriots on stage, you're making music together, you know, you have a certain amount of artistic freedom and, I don't know, healthier life, maybe? Or certainly a healthier lifestyle. And it affords you the opportunity to do other things like teach. In 2009, uh, I was a laureate and a finalist for the Sion Ballet International Violin Competition, and so I got to play the Beethoven Concerto with an orchestra. Uh, when I was a kid, I did a lot more of that. You know, the result of the competitions was you know maybe a cash prize, but often uh, an appearance with orchestra. So I think I played the introduction in Rondo Capriccioso of Saint-Saëns way more times than I should have for my age. But and in school, I got to play the Sinfonia Concertante of Mozart with a wonderful violist, Ayani Kozasa. I used to play with the Sejong soloists, which is an unconducted chamber orchestra. And so I got to play Vivaldi, one of the Vivaldi seasons with them. And I enjoyed doing it, but I think chamber music is where it's at. 